Shabbat Shalom again and welcome. And last week we didn't meet in person. And for those of you that came in a little bit late, we have to be cleaned up and out of here by 745 because the church is having an event here at 8 o'clock. So I'm going to try to keep this short and nobody laugh. Oh, Linda's not here. She always laughs when I say that. But anyway, last week when I live streamed this from home, and I don't know if how many of you got to see it, but it's from Ephesians chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter six, part one. And chapter six, of course, is about spiritual warfare. It's about putting on the armor of God. It's about a weapon that's called the sword, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Paul's going to tell us in a minute. And so when we set it up last week to set up the background of the spiritual warfare, and when you look around at what's going on around us today, if you don't know we're in spiritual warfare, I don't even know what to say, other than you're probably already a casualty if you don't realize it. As my friend Ralph Martin always says, if you don't know there's spiritual warfare going on, you're already a casualty. And then I like to tell people it's not 1960 anymore. The demons have been unleashed. And then you'll go back to a revelation where it says when Satan knows his time is short, he gets very aggressive. And I don't know if he's ever been as aggressive as he is now, but we're in a war. And we're going to learn a little bit tonight about what we have to do to be ready for this war. What we have to do, as Paul's going to say, to stand. Most people are collapsing. Most mainline churches are collapsing. Leadership collapsing. People in the pews collapsing. The great falling away that Paul talks about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we've seen happen. I mean, those of us that are here that, are, that have a lot of gray hair can remember a time where Everybody went to church on Sunday. No matter what church you went to, everybody went to church on Sunday. Now, it's pretty rare that somebody goes to church on Sunday. And I'm, very, I'm also, I wanted to mention a minute ago, I'm also very honored that Pastor Peter Pritchard and his wife June are here. Wave your hand, Pastor Peter. They are, he is the pastor of the Shepherd's Church in Rocky River. It's on Center Ridge Road. Uh, if you're looking for a place to go on Sunday morning and you live on the west side, it's awesome. He's a great teacher. He loves the Lord. He's grounded in the scriptures. There's no, um, you don't go there for the kind of the entertainment and the high five Jesus that I always talk about. He teaches the real thing. So the Shepherd's Church, Pastor Peter Pritchard. You can talk to him later if, if you're interested. He, he might even give you some information, I don't know, <laughs> or a card or something. But anyway, so this is called Armor and Sword. And we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're down to verse 13. So if you want to flip there or click there or whatever, or if you just want to watch it up here. So after he sets up this whole thing about warfare, therefore, now whoever comes to any of my Bible studies, which some of you do, when the word therefore is there, you have to ask, what is it there for? Paul loves to use the word therefore. Loves it. If you see how many chapters start with therefore, the writer to the Hebrews starts almost every chapter with therefore, because they build up an argument, they build up a system of teaching, and then they say, so therefore. So Paul says, therefore, since we're in a battle, since we're fighting powers and principalities, we're fighting an unseen enemy. You know, if we're holed up in this building and there's a group of humans that are attacking across the parking lot, we know that they're humans just like us. We can figure out a defense. We can figure out how to deal with this. But we're fighting an unseen enemy who's been around for many, many years millennia who doesn't have to get who doesn't get tired doesn't have to sleep doesn't have to stop and eat 
isn't looking for donuts in the morning like some people I know. He's actually always on the prowl. You know, Peter writes, I can I always get mixed up if it's first Peter or second Peter. He talks about how Satan, the devil roams around the earth seeking who he can devour. You know, he tempted Messiah Jesus in the desert. Do you think he's going to hesitate to take you on? He can have all of us for breakfast. So an unseen enemy, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. You don't fall. You have to know how to stand. And how do you stand? You have to take up the whole armor. Do you take up a little bit of armor? Do you take up, well, maybe I'll put a helmet on. Oh, maybe I'll just put some boots on. No, the whole armor so that you can stand. And it, it points out that it's the armor of God. It's not armor that we make. It's not the plan that we make on how to fight. It's his plan. Our plans don't usually amount to much. You know, as you read through the scripture, you realize plans that humans make usually don't amount to much. They usually fail. It's usually a disaster. David made a lot, love David, but he made a lot of plans that didn't work out. Peter made plans that didn't work out. Not Pastor Peter, the other one. But everybody who makes a human plan, it's not going to work because he provides the armor. He provides the defense. We have to put it on. We do have to do something. We have to put the armor on. Now, obviously, it's not a physical, um, literal thing where you're going to wake up in the morning and find a suit of armor in your room and you say, oh, there it is. I'll put it on. But he provides the armor. We have to put it on. We have to be completely covered in order to fight this battle. Because we are fighting powers and principalities. Powers and from the heavenly places. You know, the Jews and Greeks called everything above the level of the ground, the heavens. So like the atmosphere was the heaven. It doesn't mean like heaven or the throne. It's like we're fighting the, Paul called them, called Satan the prince of the power of the air. Jesus called him the ruler of this world was going to be judged that night. So he provides it. We have to put it on, and we have to be completely covered in the armor. We have to withstand Satan and his attacks. Where do we get, Who knows where we get the word Satan? Who knows? Hebrew word, hasatan, the adversary. The adversary. Sometimes it's translated the enemy. Sometimes it's translated the deceiver. It's the adversary. What's an adversary? Somebody who's always attacking you. Somebody who's always trying to take advantage of you. Somebody who's always trying to take you down, to change your mind. What are you doing on Friday night going to some stupid Bible study? You worked all week. You're tired. Why don't you go out to dinner, have a few drinks, relax, go home, go to bed. What are you going to go listen to that for? Yeah, what am I going to listen to that for? I mean, this group doesn't do that, but, you know, like Eve, did God really say that? Yeah, he did. Yeah, but do you think that's what he really meant? Come on, Eve, can't you figure this out? He's trying to keep you under his thumb. He's trying to dominate you. Yeah. Yeah, what is he trying to pull? Give me that apple. Here, Adam, you take a bite. He's the adversary, and he's always on the attack. And he talks about the day of evil and temptation. That's like every day, right? And yeah, even if you're a believer, and even if you're following, and even if you're praying, and even if you're studying scripture, and even if you're going to church, and even if you're going to the Bible study, and you're going to, you're still going to come under attack. Because then you're a threat to him. You know, if you're sitting in the back pew of some church and you're looking at your watch going, 
oh, when is this guy ever going to shut up so we can get out of here? He's not going to attack you because you're not a threat. When he hears Pastor Mike Booker here preaching, he's going to come under attack. You know, when we used to do missions in Mexico City, after a while, we used to kind of chuckle about it because whenever we were preparing the week before to go, all the attacks would start. You know, then you got to expect them. The first time you say, gee, why is this not working? Why is this happening? Why did this guy call and get me all upset? Why did... Because you're always under attack because powerful assaults come. And he says, you have to stand your ground, which means you don't yield. The church today is yielding to everything. You want to bless gay couples? Sure, sure, no problem. You want to tell the little boy who wants to be a little girl? Oh, that's okay, Sonny. Whatever you think is best. Trying to be more and more like the world. You're not supposed to yield. You're supposed to stand your ground. You're supposed to put the armor on. If you don't put the armor on, you're dead. Guaranteed casualty. You know, James says, resist the devil and he will flee. But it doesn't, that doesn't mean you say, hey, devil, I'm sick of you. Get out of here. There's a certain procedure that goes on. So we stand our ground and not yield. We, we have to trust him because he is our defense. I don't remember what psalm it is. He is my defense. It's a great Marty Getz song. Um, he is my defense. I shall not be moved. It's one of the Psalms. You have to trust in him to be your defense. You don't trust in your own power. You don't trust in the power of a couple of, you know, friends of yours who you kind of known for a while and you don't, trust necessarily the people that you're that are sitting next to you at church you trust him to be your defense it's very hard for me to be somebody's defense right so you trust him to be the defense we have to trust the provisions that he gives us we have to be good soldiers oh i don't know about this i don't like this i don't like this armor I don't like the rations I've been getting. The seats aren't comfortable. It's always too hot in here. My feet hurt. Why did I come? Right? That's the song of our generation. Oh, I'll go if, I, if it's comfortable. I'll go if things are nice. I don't want anybody to be judgmental. I don't want anybody to hurt my feelings. I just want to go and have, well, you know, 57 minutes and go home. So we have to be good soldiers. And if we are, we can resist. If we trust in him, we put on his armor, we trust in his provision, we're going to be good soldiers and we can resist the attacks. Like a military unit has to be disciplined, right? That's why they train. You can't be a frontline army unit with 2,000 guys that are all making their own plan. Oh, hey, Lieutenant, that's never going to work. Let's do this instead. Or, hey, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm going to go wash up, have something to eat. I'll come back in a couple hours. A battle is a discipline. Or the enemy will overrun you. So we can resist. Stand, therefore, again, therefore, so stand, don't yield. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Truth? Wait a minute, I thought truth was relative. What's true for you may not be true for me. What's true for me may not be true for her, but aren't we all three right? No, there's truth with a capital T. Gird your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, so here we got two things. We got a belt, which we're talking about ancient people, right? Men didn't wear pants. He's not talking about this kind of a belt. They wore kind of robe-like things, and they had ropes tied around them. This is where girding your loins comes from, because when they're going to, it's kind of hard to run if you're wearing a dress. 
<laughs> it's kind of hard to fight if your legs are inside of a robe. So they would roll up the robe and tie the rope around it. That was called girding your loins. So when the Bible says, gird your loins so you can fight, that's what it's talking about. So you have freedom to move your legs. And the breastplate of righteousness. So we got two things already. So we stand armed. In Romans 13, 12, Paul calls it the armor of light. He refers to how we have the armor of light. What's light? Jesus Yeshua is the light of the world. He's not talking about you guys got the armor of light because you're so awesome. He's not saying, oh, you guys got great armor over here compared to that church over there. They're a disaster. No, it's not our armor. Armor. It's our armor of light. It's an armor of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 6, 7. Armor. What's armor for? It's to protect you. Now, this is ancient times. They're not talking about like those Middle Ages knights that have like all that stuff and the armor, the horse is armored and, you know, all they have is the little visor that goes up and down. You've seen ancient soldiers. They got armor, like a little skirt-like thing with armor. They got armor over here. They got helmets. They got gloves and swords. They got shoes. But Paul calls this, Paul talks about armor a lot. Because an armor is how you resist attacks, how you're protected from attacks. So your waist is girded with truth. That refers to the sincerity that you have in your inward parts. I'm wrapping truth around me. This is what I know to be true. This is what I know to be the gospel. This is what I know to be salvation. This is what I know that Messiah is and what he does and what he did for me. I know this for a fact. I know that there's God and he loves me even though I'm a sinner. And he sends Messiah Yeshua, his only begotten son, to die for me. This is the truth I know. So if somebody over here is telling me something different, I say, I don't believe that. We're girded with truth. Truth is in every part of us. You know, ancient people always talk about the loins. You know, it's like the upper parts of your thigh, the lower part of your belly, because your upper thighs are strong. You got strong muscles here. So when you're a young soldier who's, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, your legs are strong. That's why people who are, you know, in their 50s and 60s and 70s can be soldiers. I'd love to join the IDF, but I don't think they'll take me. <laughs> oh, come on. This is a tough crowd. <laughs> it's the strength they thought was in their loins. So you got your legs wrapped up. You got your waist wrapped up in truth. And it also keeps you from wandering because you're wrapped up in the truth. So when you know the truth... When you stand on a foundation of truth, when a counterfeit comes on the horizon, you immediately recognize it, right? If you're girded in truth, you don't say, well, that guy over there's got a pretty good point. Yeah, and I was talking to my Buddhist friend the other day and he made some pretty good points. I can't tell you when I was working in the office, and this never happened with Ron, but Monica used to hear it. Monica's not here tonight. But, you know, people would say to me, boy, you take this Jesus stuff pretty seriously. And I would say, what should I take more seriously? What's more serious than that? What's more important than that? If you don't think about the cross 20 times a day, you don't get what happened there. Nothing compares to this, like the song says. Nothing compares to this. I could care less what my cholesterol is. I could care less whether I have a black car or a white car or a brown. I don't care what, how many things I have in my house. I don't, who cares? That's all going to be gone soon. I hope it's tonight. But it's all going to be gone soon. He's what's important. So when we have that truth... You don't say, gee, I'd like to do the Jesus thing today, but, you know, I, I, really, I really can't because, you know, I got to 
plant the garden. I got to go do the thing. I got to go trim those bushes. Um, if I go do this other thing tonight, I can make another extra thousand dollars. I better go over there. No, it, the truth keeps you from wandering away. And it gets you set up when you do talk to people, you have something to present. So when you're a Buddhist friend and, you know, just picking something that I don't have anything against Buddhists particularly, but when your Buddhist friend says, oh yeah, you know, I used to go to a church, but then I found Buddha and now I Buddhist and it's so much nicer because I'm just, I'm just part of the whole creation. And when I die, I'm just going to go into nothingness. And you say, wrong. Why would you want to go into nothingness? We have a God who loves you and wants to save you and wants to take you into paradise with him. Why do you want to go into nothingness? Why don't you come to Jesus and be saved? Instead of saying, wow, you know, that guy's got some good points. Maybe I should rethink all this. So, Isaiah 11.5 says, Messiah, I love, you know, as you all know, Isaiah is my favorite major prophet. Messiah will have righteousness as the girdle of his loins. He's going to have righteousness wrapped around him. Because he's our righteousness. Remember I always say, if you only want to memorize one verse in the whole Bible, you know, I say, I'm not going to, I can't deal with the Bible, but I only want to memorize one verse. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who did not know sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. We don't become righteous in ourselves. We become righteous in him. So Messiah is going to have righteousness around him. Jeremiah 13.11. God clings to Israel like a girdle clings to a man. Their definition of girdle is different than ours. But you know what I just described as a belt. God clings to Israel like a belt clings to a man. Messiah is going to be belted in righteousness. He's our righteousness. Then he talks about the breastplate. It protects the heart. It secures the heart. You know, ancient people thought emotions all came from your heart. Believe it or not, nobody knew that the blood that the heart pumped blood until the 1600s. That's really hard to believe. Really hard to believe. But anyway, I mean, the heart's a very simple, it's probably the simplest drug and all it does is pump. It's like two water pumps side by side. I mean, compared to your brain or even compared to your kidneys or your liver, your heart's it's important that the pump goes, though, because as soon as <laughs> it doesn't take long for you to get in trouble when the pump stops. Oh, come on. That's a little bit funny. So so the heart, the ancient people thought all your emotions and your life functions were in your heart. That's why you still, you still say, well, I gave my heart to this or, you know, I put my whole heart into this. That doesn't mean you put your left ventricle that's pumping blood into it. it means your whole emotion was in it so it protects the breastplate protects your heart and many vital organs are under the rib cage most of your liver is under the rib cage kidneys are under the rib cage the lungs of course are encased in the rib cage so the breastplate secures a lot of vital organs and it's the breastplate of righteousness. And again, the righteousness of Messiah is our protection. Our protection. So that you can stand, so that you won't yield. Imagine, well, before I say what I'm going to say, you know, in the, from the middle of the 20th century until now, so... 70 years or so, eight, nine, 90 years or so, no, 70 years or so, there have been more Christian martyrs than all the other centuries combined. Everybody thinks everybody, Christians were martyred by the Romans and, you know, all in the first couples. No, more martyrs now than any time during history. What happens with martyrs? They say, I'm a believer. 
And the oppressor says, well, if you don't renounce Christ, we're going to kill you. And they say, well, I don't renounce him. I guess you're going to have to kill me. We had when we had ISIS. I'll never forget, uh, you know, they used to videotape their beheadings and show them. I don't know if you ever saw any of them. It's pretty sickening. And I didn't watch the complete, but they had lined up, I don't remember how many men who were Egyptian Christians on a beach. And they told them to renounce Christ or they would behead them. And every single one of them said, no, we will not renounce Christ. And as the guy came down the line, cutting their heads off with a sword, everybody in that line was calling out to Jesus. And seconds later, they were with him. They could have said, oh, we're not, no, 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 I don't believe in any of that stuff anymore. I used to believe it a long time ago, but not anymore. Whew. Oh, cool, that was a close one. Okay, you can go home then, we won't kill you. Oh, God. Whew. No, they said, you're going to have to kill me. Go ahead and behead me. I'm not going to renounce the Lord. So he's our protection. It defends and fortifies our hearts, and it deflects arrows that come. Big piece of, a big piece of, of armor. It doesn't, however, protect your back. It's a breastplate. Your back is not protected. The lesson is, you don't turn your back on the enemy. Because <laughs> he could come up from behind and attack you. But the breastplate deflects the arrows of the attack. Paul also calls it breastplate of faith and love. Paul is really into armor. And we say, yeah, 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 that's really nice. He wrote, this was the guy who said, you know, shipwrecked three times, beaten with rods, stoned, left for dead, attacked by my people, attacked by Gentiles, attacked in the city, attacked in the countryside. But I keep going. I've learned how to live with food, without food. Sometimes I'm cold. Sometimes I'm not cold. But hey, whatever it is, I go on. We're like, oh, I don't know. That church isn't even air conditioned. I'm not going over there. <clears throat> and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shod your feet. Military shoes were made out of metal, usually brass. Roman soldiers had really cool ones. And those are the main ones that Paul knew. Because not only did it protect your feet from, you know, swords and spears and arrows, but it would also protect you from traps that were laid in the ground. They used to sharpen sticks and put them in the ground. And if an army went running, you know, they were camouflaged. And all of a sudden, you got these sticks through your feet. So they made metal shoes. So you put these on your feet to protect yourself. And weapons and traps. So when we adhere to the gospel, we walk more confidently. Right? If I walk into Panera's in the morning to meet Pastor Peter and we're going to have coffee, I'm confident that I know the gospel and I love the gospel and I know that he's confident in the gospel and he loves the gospel. And I go walk in there confidently and I say, we both love the gospel. I'm at peace here. As opposed to when I interact with some of my friends and family members, but that's another story. <clears throat> so we ad when we hear to adhere to the gospel, we walk more confidently. We have a resolved, confident heart. And we have our feet protected so that we can walk steadily. Do you ever you remember at the Last Supper, like most of you have been to Messianic Sayers, either at my house or here or at a church? This year we're doing six of them, so I'll keep you posted. One's going to be here. But you know, at the point where there's a washing of the hands, you remember Yeshua washes their feet. That's not what you do at a Seder. I mean, those guys who were there were like, what is he doing? What are, what are you doing? And Peter, who's always willing to say something, 
says, hey, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Come on. Uh, you're going to wash my Like John the Baptist, like, wait a minute, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And Yeshua, Jesus tells him, if I don't wash your feet, you're not going to come into the kingdom. And then Peter says, whoa, then wash all of me. And Jesus says, only your feet have to be cleaned if you've cleaned yourself. Why is that? Because we walk through a filthy world. We walk through filthy places. The rest of your body may be clean, but you can see metaphorically, your feet get dirty. With filth, you have to wash the feet. So we walk around with our feet protected. It helps. I'm not going to go there. So if my friends say, hey, we're going to this place tonight, do you want to come? And I say, uh, I don't think so. What kind of place is it? Well, blah, blah, blah. no. I'm going to the prayer meeting. I'm going to the Bible study. I'm going to the, and they say, whatever. Your feet don't go to where you're going to be threatened. So we walk confidently. We worry less about obstacles if our feet are protected. You know, imagine those soldiers, if they're just wearing, if they're running around barefoot or if they're just running around wearing sandals, all kinds of traps are laid for them. Arrows are flying, spears are flying. You don't advance as confidently as if you have your feet shod in metal. So he says, put that on your feet. The gospel brings peace. It brings peace with God, of course. Oh, but wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that Jesus is the only way that you can come to peace with God? Yes. Come on, really, tell me. You really believe that? Yes. That is so narrow-minded. That is so unrealistic. That is ridiculous. You've heard that, I'm sure. You know, and I sometimes say, did you see the passion of the Christ? And most people will go, oh, yeah. I say, pretty hard to watch, isn't it? They go, oh, it's horrible. And I say, well, if there were 58 other ways to go to heaven, or if you could go to heaven by being good and being nice, then Jesus was mentally ill. Why would he go through that? He would have just come and said, everybody be nice. If you want to follow me, that's cool. You know, I'll have you. That's great. You know, if you want to follow Buddha, you want to follow Krishna, you want to follow Confucius, they're really good guys, good teachers. You want to follow them? No, he says, I'm the only way. So we have peace with God. We have peace within ourselves. And the enemy hates that. The enemy hates that. Did you want to have peace within yourself? The enemy hates that. He doesn't want you to have peace. Even if he knows he's not going to get you into his disgusting, dark kingdom, ultimately, he's, going, he's trying to ruin you while you're here so that you can't impact others, so that you'll be discouraged. And it also helps prevent, as I kind of mentioned, from temptation. So we're strengthened in how we stand if we have our feet in armor. We're not going to go someplace where we're going to get weakened. You know, in 1 Corinthians, I don't remember the chapter, Paul says, you know, if moral people hang around with immoral people, I'm paraphrasing, hang around with immoral people, they get influenced by that. You go hang around with immoral people for a couple of weeks, you start to see the effect of that. Don't go there. And it, of course, leads to peace with others. And the word says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. The gospel of peace is the light that your feet walk by. The law doesn't do that. Messiah does that. Yes? No? Above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now we got the shield of faith. Above all, faith. He says, above all, faith. Above all, faith. This is the new covenant. 
He doesn't say above all law. You better get into that law and I better not ever see you breaking a one of them. Above all, faith. Faith in his promises, faith in his protection. We know he's not going to change his mind. Oh, I changed my mind about the salvation thing. <laughs> Hope it's not going to be too much trouble to you guys, but sorry. Now in order to be saved, you have to do this other thing. No, that's not going to happen because the promises are eternal and our protection is through faith. And the shield, which is faith, blocks the attacks, blocks the fiery darts. And the shield, you can turn in any direction. You can't move your breastplate around, but the shield, you can move around. Depending which direction the attack's coming from, you can turn it. Because attacks come from all directions. And so if that is faith, faith is a universal defense. I don't care if my neighbor thinks I'm crazy. I don't care if my neighbor thinks I'm narrow-minded. I have faith. I know the gospel. I know I'm going to stand. The shield is a universal defense. It gives you, faith gives you victory over the world. How can we have victory over the world if we don't have faith? If we're wishy-washy? Well, I don't know. 30,000 churches have left the Methodist church. 30,000 separate churches have left the Methodist church. The Church of England has completely imploded. But there's always a remnant. Now there's faithful people, priests, bishops, who have started the Free Church of England to get back to the scripture, to get back to the foundation. We won't even talk about what's coming out of the Vatican because I don't want to get into all that because who can understand it? But you got to stand. You got to stand. See here, Satan's called the wicked one. And his attacks are fiery darts. Fiery darts. They're deep wounds, inflamed wounds, like the fiery serpents in Book of Numbers. Fiery darts. And they come fast. Darts come fast. And sometimes you don't even know what's on you. <clears throat> and if you don't have a shield, you don't have armor on, you get a deep inflamed wound. But he says, faith blocks the fiery darts. Pretty cool, huh? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword's the only offensive weapon here. Everything else is defensive. You got the helmet, you got the breastplate, you got the belt, you got the shoes, you got the shield, you got the helmet. So take the sword, the sword. And it's called the sword of the spirit. And it's the word. Why is it called the sword of the spirit? <clears throat> because the word is breathed out by the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. The Ruach HaKodesh breathes out the word. Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is breathed out. Theopneustos, breathed out. Paul just doesn't write what he feels like writing. Moses doesn't write down whatever he feels like writing. The Holy Spirit breathes it out. And it's the sword. So the helmet secures your head. Right? You don't want to get hit in the head with a sword, or even an arrow for that matter, <clears throat> or a spear. We have salvation on our mind. We know about salvation. We know what we believe. We know what's truth, capital T. The helmet secures our brain, secures our head. So we don't despair. Our mind is protected so that we can stand, we can trust, we know what our position is. Oh, Lord, you don't understand how awesome I am. I'm pretty awesome. I mean, compared to that guy over there, <laughs> you've been paying attention to what I've been doing? Not only have I never killed anybody, I've done a lot of cool, good stuff. Are you making notes? No. <clears throat> we know what our position is. I posted that thing on, I don't know whichever of you are, my Facebook friends, but it's a quote from Spurgeon. There's a picture of a cross and a guy like this under the cross. 
And the quote was something like, you know, some people come and they boast about all the things they do at church. He goes, I just sit at the foot of the cross and I marvel that I'm even saved. I thought, wow, is that ever awesome? We said, how could you save somebody like me? How could you save somebody like that? You all know who Corey Ten Boon is. You know, Ten Boon family in Amsterdam, they hid Jews. The Nazis found out. They took the whole family to the camp. Her brother, or her sister and her father died in the camp. She survived. The war was over and she was going through churches in Germany preaching. And she was at a church and she saw the guy, a guy she recognized as one of the SS guards at the prison. And he was way in the back of the room. And when she was finished talking, he sheepishly went up to her and said, I know you don't remember me, but I was a guard at the camp. And she said, I do remember you and I forgive you for what you did. And the guy just started weeping openly, fell down to his knees. Said, this is the kind of faith I want. I want Jesus. I don't want all this other stuff. Oh, yes, we will pray. Yes, do the best you can. And tomorrow will be a better day. No, I want somebody to say, you are an SS guard, but I forgive you. Jesus says, you are an SS guard. You come to me and confess your sins and I'll forgive you. And you'll be in heaven just like the guy that you executed because he was a Christian. So we know our position. So we guard our heads from being contaminated. We don't want our minds defiled. We keep our focus because we don't have to worry about our heads being injured. I had a concussion once in Mexico City. It took me four months to recover. I walked around four months in a brain fog, seeing double and not being able to see over here. And, and I thought, man, head injuries are something. <laughs> That's a little bit funny. Thessalonians, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And the sword, of course, is called the sword of the Spirit. It's the power of the word. Hebrews 4, sharper than a two-edged sword. Cuts, two-edged sword cuts in both directions. So you don't have to go, you go, and it cuts, cuts through bone and, you know, lists it there in Hebrews 4. And it exposes what the heart's thinking. It exposes what you are because the word cuts through you. You know, Alistair Begg always says, when you sit down and say, I'm going to examine the Bible, after a while you realize the Bible's examining you. And you say, ooh, I never thought about that before. Oh, so it's a two-edged sword. It's the offensive. And it's necessary, of course, to have a weapon when you're in battle. You can't just have protection. You have to have a weapon, and you have to stand and fight. So we're in this horrendous spiritual warfare now. The time for church as usual is long past. The time of denominations bickering with each other, long past. We're in, in a fight. But always keep in mind Psalm 2, where David writes that, you know, people plot against the Lord and his anointed, which is kind of a messianic psalm. Plot against the Lord and his anointed, and the princes of the earth plot against him, and God sits in the heaven and laughs. He's not intimidated by what the World Economic Forum's doing or what the president's doing or the some king somewhere is doing. But we're his soldiers. And we have to stand for the, in the fight and not yield. Woo.